Tonight on Brian Ross Investigates, California prosecutors say this church leader, a self-proclaimed apostle, used his power over young women to turn them into his sex slaves. Now for the first time, one of them speaks out. Naked, during sexual affairs. Describing how the man she was taught to obey as Jesus on earth beat her when she refused his perverted demands. You can't tell him no. You can't tell him this isn't right. Plus the latest on that deadly virus spreading fast from China to dozens of countries, including the U.S. New cases are still popping up around the world on a daily basis. What can Americans do to protect themselves? One of the country's leading experts joins us. And our shout out for the student journalist in Hong Kong on the front lines of that city's protests, even after this young woman got shot with a rubber bullet. And he turned to become this. From the Law and Crime Network studios in New York City's Herald Square, this is Brian Ross Investigates. Good evening and welcome. Tonight we're going to hear from a young woman who says she was recruited to be a sex slave for the powerful men who run her church with the grooming beginning, she says, at the age of nine. It's a sordid tale, but one backed up by disclosures in court papers following the arrest and pending trial of her church leader. Her name is Sochil Martin, and prosecutors say she's among dozens of young girls to be trafficked by the powerful church leader over the last decade. But she's the first to come forward and speak publicly. He is Jesus. He's Jesus here on earth. He was the purest, most perfect man on earth. Nason Joaquin Garcia is called the apostle by the millions of followers who he claims belong to his Light of the World Church, an evangelical fundamentalist church active in every state in the United States and in dozens of other countries around the world. So everything that I was taught to do for him, um, it wasn't wrong. It was, it was a ble it was blessing, it was a blessing. But now Sochil Martin says she knows better that what she did for the apostle was wrong, very wrong. And now she's coming forward in this interview and in a lawsuit set to be filed soon, claiming the apostle turned her into a sex slave and ordered her to help him recruit young boys and girls for sex trafficking. Did you see times where there were girls under the age of 17 who were involved in a sexual relationship or having sex? With Nason? Yes. All the time. In which he was... Yes. Having Sexually, sex with them? Yes. Essentially Having, raping them, right? Yes. I, I was there. You saw that? I saw that. Often? Occasionally? Often. It was an everyday thing. So Chill Martin's account comes as the church leader is already behind bars in Los Angeles, awaiting trial on sex trafficking charges brought by the California Attorney General. He has pleaded not guilty. The type of crimes that belong nowhere in our society, from human trafficking, production of child pornography, oral copulation, rape, statutory rape, child molestation, extortion, conspiracy, and more. So Chill says she's now cooperating with the California Attorney General and with the FBI and federal prosecutors the first alleged victim of Garcia to speak publicly. I was a men member of the church for 30 years of my life. I was born into the church, fourth generation. My great-grandparents, my grandparents, were one of the first members of the Los Angeles church. The church is run like a family business. It was founded by Garcia's grandfather in Guadalajara, Mexico. He was the first self-proclaimed apostle, a title he passed on to his son, Samuel. So Chill says it was Samuel who first introduced her to the dark side of the church. I was nine, nine, ten years old when I was taught and taken to Samuel. And you're, you're right when you say it's a dark place, just because even when you're that young, you know something's off no matter what they tell you. 
But she says inside the church, the young girls recruited for the apostle are considered special, encouraged even by their own mothers to serve him. You think that you're chosen and you're, you're taught that you're lucky. You're lucky to be there and that you're the, the rest of the girls that you're around. Wow, out of all of these girls in the church, thousands and thousands of members of the church in this congregation, out of all of them, I, I'm chosen. When you're taken to a private room or to one of his private homes or his private properties and you're forced to take your clothes off for them and touch them and seduce them in a way that an older woman would, your mother was actually encouraging you to do this? She took me, yes. She would buy things for me and she would take me physically and... Knowing what was going on? Yes. And she would speak to him before and after. Why would she do that? I, she thought it was okay. She herself, she was young, she was... She was with him. She was one of his concubines. So I'm guessing that she thought that it was okay to do it. Later, as a high school student in Los Angeles, attending John Marshall High School, Sochil says she was then seduced and molested by Nessun Garcia, who was married at the time but not yet crowned the apostle. He would caress my, my buttocks and my waist and the sides of my breasts. So in my head, again... I still try to believe that it wasn't that bad, but it's bad. And I guess if you want to call it that, it is. He molested me at age 16, and I didn't see it that way. So Schill says when Nason took over running the church following the death of his father, the relationship grew more extensive and weirder including recording scenes of group sex with so chill and underage girls. Naked, during sexual affairs and you know, the groups of women. group sex, and he would re record with phones and iPads and tablets, and he had his computer. And he would download all of it, and he would, he would keep that with him. In fact, the California prosecutors have said in court they have recovered scores of the apostles' phones and tablets and computers with sex tapes of underage children. There's devices that have content that we've identified as child pornography. Does it bother you that you're in those videos? It does, just because in the moment when you're there, you think it's a blessing. But things came to a head, so Jill Martin says, when she refused to perform a sex act on a 14-year-old boy in front of the boy's mother and the apostle. She says the apostle was furious at her refusal and gave her a beating. After the situation with him, with the little boy, he calls me back and that's what happened. He, he, he leaned me over and he, he struck me until I couldn't feel my right leg. You tell him to stop? You can't tell him to stop. You can't tell him no. You can't tell him this isn't right. You can't tell him it hurts. You can't tell him. You can't tell him that you're unhappy. You can't tell. You can't tell him that you're in pain. You can't tell him that you're confused. You can't say any of that. Lawyers for the apostle have already attacked Sochil Martin saying in court papers they have uncovered new evidence of Sochil Martin's own criminal conduct, saying she groomed underage girls in an attempt to extort Mr. Garcia, showing them how to pose sexy and allegedly telling others she was in love with Mr. Garcia and repeatedly described him as her everything. When he asked you to be with these young women, minor girls, you went along with that? You don't have a choice. You don't have a choice. 
like everything in my being, my mind, my, my body, everything I, I was taught my entire life was that that was okay. It was done to me. It was done to my mom. It was done to all those other girls that I grew up around and their moms were okay with it. So Chill Martin has now left the church and is in the California Witness Relocation Program, treated as an outcast by her family with the church denouncing her wherever they can. I lost my family, I lost friends, I lost my society, I lost my world. I fell down, I, I was beat up, I was kicked, I was emotionally, physically, mentally. The bravest thing I ever did was get back up when I wanted to die. And that's what I feel happened. So now that I'm up, I feel like it's my responsibility to keep going. Try all you want, but the truth is there. And justice is there. And it's waiting for you. We asked lawyers for the church leader, Garcia, and other officials of the church to respond to the allegations of Socio Martin, but our calls were not returned. In court papers filed last month by the California Attorney General, prosecutors said they have discovered even more evidence of his sexual abuse of young boys and girls, thousands of pornographic images, they say, evidence they say of how Garcia the Apostle uses his position in the church to satisfy his seemingly insatiable appetite for young girls. Up next, the latest on that virus out of China, now called a global health emergency. We'll talk with one of the country's leading experts. Back now with a fast developing story. The World, World Health Organization has now declared that virus in China as a global health emergency, meaning it's a serious threat to countries well beyond China. The death toll is now more than 170, with more than 8,000 people reported to be infected in at least 19 countries. And those numbers seem to be growing exponentially every day. It's called the coronavirus, ground zero traced to an open-air market in the Chinese city of Wuhan that sold exotic animals, including snakes and rats, for their meat. As the virus spreads, so do the concerns of public health officials here in the U.S. and around the world. The news has sent the U.S. stock market into a tailspin. And officials at the Weld Horse Organization today are trying to prevent a coronavirus panic in the media. Over the past few weeks, we have witnessed the emergence of a previously unknown pathogen, which has escalated into an unprecedented outbreak and which has been met by an unprecedented response. As I have said repeatedly since my return from Beijing, the Chinese government is to be congratulated for the extraordinary measures it has taken to contain the outbreak, despite the severe social and economic impact those measures are having on the Chinese people. So tonight, to get the story straight about this virus, we're joined again by Dr. William Schaffner of Vanderbilt University, one of the country's foremost experts on preventive medicine and communicable diseases. And doctor, thank you for being here. You're on the phone as we break on this story. We talked last week, you held out some hope. This might not be as bad as you had feared, but do you still feel that way? Well, I still have a great deal of hope, but it is appropriate determination that we have this as an public health emergency of international concern. In effect, it will quarantine China and reduce the travel to and from China, hoping to more confine this infection to that country and reduce exportations to other parts of the world. Today, as you know, Dr. Shafton, there's a report of another uh, infected person in Illinois, a human-to-human -human transfer of the virus. What's the significance of that? Well, the important thing to remember is that our public health system in the United States is working. The patient had been informed. She reported her illness immediately. She was put in isolation, and the public health team was right away. There's no further spread at the present time. We're doing this for every single reported case. The clinicians and the public health people are working hand in glove. Dr. Schaffner, a question for you from our control room from executive producer Rhonda Schwartz. Rhonda? 
Dr. Schaffner, we see folks all around the world wearing face masks. There's advice on the internet. You should be using bleach in your house. What can people do to try to protect themselves? Well, I think we need to take a deep breath step back and recognize that influenza, which is in every state, is a much greater hazard to us than is the coronavirus at present. Uh, masks are not recommended by the CDC. There are really very scant data that they help people in the community prevent infection. Wash your hands. Avoid people who are coughing and sneezing. And if you're ill, ask yourself two questions. Have I recently returned from China? Have I had close contact with someone who's recently returned from China? And if the answer to those two questions is no, you've got the flu, not coronavirus. And Dr. Schaffner, for this Thank coronavirus, you. is there any sort of vaccine or treatment that can be found at this point? In the works. Brian, it's going to be available in months, assuming that the vaccine work uh, proceeds without a problem. The scientists are collaborating internationally to get that vaccine to us as quickly as possible. It's been great being with you. Thank you so much. Dr. Schaffner, thank you so much for being with us tonight. This can be a frightening time and your insights help all of us to understand just what's going on. Up next, our shout out for the student journalist in Hong Kong on the front lines. This week marked Student Press Freedom Day to celebrate the contributions of student journalists all over the world. We, over the past year, have recognized the work of journalists at the high school in Parkland, Florida in the wake of the terrible shooting there. And the efforts by the students at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, whose paper is now the only daily newspaper in that city. And tonight our shout out is for another group of student journalists who have put themselves literally on the front lines, braving possible violence as they cover the protests in the city of Hong Kong where demonstrators have rallied against the heavy hand of China in running their city, which was supposed to be independent of Beijing. The images of the Hong Kong protesters facing off with police have led to worldwide condemnation of Hong Kong and authorities in Beijing. A live image right now, what's happening there on the streets of Hong Kong. Authorities fired tear gas and pepper spray with the city's police commissioner calling the demonstration a riot. And some of the most compelling close-up footage of what's happening, the water cannons, the tear gas, the beatings, have come from a team of college journalists in Hong Kong. Joanna Ho is one of them, using her iPhone and a small camera to record the scene ready for anything. We have gas masks and we have helmets, helmets like this. And let me ask you this, do you fear that you might get hurt covering all this? Because it's become violent at some point with the police and the protesters squaring off. Yes, I'm afraid of that and I got hurt in November and I was, I got hurt by a rubber bullet. Where did you get hit and how, how did it feel? It felt painful. Uh, it was originally like this, and then it turned to become like this. The bullet hit you in the leg? Yes. Joanna is part of a group of college-age journalism students who felt the call to record and report on what is happening in their city, despite the risk of getting hurt or arrested. Their online outlet, Undergrad, is run by Oscar Cho. Why is it important for you to be out there? It's because the, the amount of journalists in the front lines is, is not enough. And, and some of the times, uh, the critical moments are, are being captured by student journalists only. And I think we are trying to like fulfill the, the demand of the journalists in the front lines to make the truth being discovered. Cho says the police call his colleagues black journalists. Police will think we are doing the illegal things. That, that's why they will call us the black journalists. And also, they are thinking that we are cooperating with the, with the protesters dressed in black. That's why they will call us the black journalists. Joanna Ho says her only real protection is the power of the press, a label she wears proudly whenever she is on the streets with the protesters.
I guess it's hard to say it's like fun to be in the front here because I guess it's not a game. Uh, I guess it's it's really challenging, but it's really rewarding at the same time. As I can really feel that what I'm doing is like making an impact to the society. And joining us now in the studio is Ariel Tu, the producer of Brian Ross Investigates, who started herself as a student journalist in uh, Taipei, Taiwan. To see these journalists in Hong Kong, they're very brave to do this, aren't they? It was really awesome because Joanna is only 20 and Oscar is 19, and he's now the editor-in-chief of Underground, which is their publication. And I myself started as a student journalist too, but the fact that they're on the front line, it's really amazing because they're risking their lives. And is there a cultural thing to challenge authority like that? Because they could be arrested, right? Not really. I don't think it's a culture thing. And like um, during the interview, Joanna did tell us that she, her parents didn't know that she's actually reporting on the front line until they saw her work. And they're still out there and their only protection is wearing the press vests. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the police have been pretty brutal there, haven't they? Yeah, I think one of the demands that Hong Kongers are trying to um, make it clear is that they want the government to investigate police brutality. And that's been the key theme for them as yeah, well. Yeah, for sure. And she recovered from her injury, the rubber bullet hitting her in the leg? Yes, so far, but I think that um, she's going to keep reporting and let's hope that she is safe. Indeed. Well, yeah, Ariel, safe. too, a great piece. Thanks for all your Thank work you. and thanks for being here tonight. We Thank appreciate you. it very much. So that's our program for tonight. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you back here on the Law and Crime Network next week.